Hi friends, welcome to the NPTEL course Strategy and Technology, a Practical Primer. We are in week 10 with the theme of Technology and Customer Centricity. In this lecture, the 48th in this series, we discuss the topic of technological behavior. We have considered in the earlier lecture that companies tend to be irrational in terms of technological behavior. They feel and act obdurate about technology. They are myopic in terms of commercial consequences of that kind of behavior. Why does it happen? Do companies have a specific technological behavior that drives their technological developments? Consumer facing companies especially have a continuous flow of new products and services. They do that to retain customer loyalty. Similarly, other industries also have similar approaches. However, we require a characteristic technological behavior to be able to be catering to such diverse technological needs. That is where the concept of technological behavior comes in. This behavior is shaped and nurtured through successive generations of industrial ecosystem. Hardware, software, novelty, timeliness and affordability are the facets of technology. These facets define the technological behavior of firms. A firm should have a fine balance between science and technology on one hand and leadership and management on the other. Then only the company can have technological perfection. A product that is developed for the future must be evaluated for the technical advantage in relation to the future competitor products. Innovation has to be retrospectively prospective. This is one important tenet of technological behavior. Please do not assess the products based on the current technologies and based on the current understanding of competitors' products. You transport yourself five years hence and then see whether the product will be able to be competitive at that point of time with other products and technologies that could emerge at that point of time. The smartphone industry, for example, offers an excellent canvas to study and test several of these concepts. This lecture focuses on the behavior of firms with respect to technology and this is called technological behavior. We need technological superiority because to be able to prime the market with new products, these products have to be superior to the previous generation products and also to, with respect to the competitor products. The cell phone industry is witness to such a continuous product flow. More manufacturers are in fray these days with more products than ever before in the marketplace. More importantly, industry level competition is commoditizing technologies as never before. And this is forcing innovator firms to keep producing innovative breakthroughs periodically. Earlier we used to have a two year span to get a new cell phone. Later on it reduced to one year. Now we have new cellular phones every six months. Some may be upgrades, some may be right sized phones. We have considered in the earlier lectures how differentiators also display a pioneering perspective by going beyond the innovation introduced by a pioneering firm. By offering incremental value even on known formats, smart superiority can be accomplished. That is the core of differentiation. In the consumer electronics industry, smartphones demonstrate this concept of commoditization and differentiation vying with each other to make the life more delectable for the consumers. How do I differentiation? Cameras had been leading the growth of early smartphone products. In the overall space, innovations in screen size, display time, pixel density, image stabilization and low light imaging continue to take place in various models. But different companies work on these things in different manners. Fundamentally, Samsung innovated on large screen phones, Galaxy series in particular and later on the Note series. But LG came up very fast. It developed similar phones but with a few differentiating features including the thinnest bezel structure that is their Z3 model of those times. Apple followed with a strategic departure from its small screen format to large screen phones. Apple always believed in small screen phones but in from iPhone 6 and 6 plus it departed its strategy towards the large screen format but it retained its famous all class structure. 
Sony brought in a differentiated value proposition with dust and water resistance in the Z series phones for the first time in the entire cellular phone history. Then Samsung developed an even larger and stylus based Note phone series and stayed on as a pioneer for a long time in that segment. It also improved the Note by bringing for the first time an edge display, Note 4 Edge. Again, it has improved the Edge concept further with a dual Edge concept that has been introduced through the mainline Galaxy series S6 and S7 Edge. These developments that took place between 2010 and 2015 in quick succession bring forth how companies eyed and achieved differentiation through different approaches but very much focused towards gaining customer attention. The foundations of technological behavior can be seen through such examples. Just as different human beings behave differently, firms also may be hypothesized to behave differently. And these are based on the firm level differences in the fundamental foundations of innovation and leadership mindsets towards technology. The way the technology in a company is nurtured by successive generations of the industrial ecosystem is also very important. We have seen in the case of Conning how successive leaders have reinforced the innovation behavior of the company. Sony makes us believe that it is always at the edge of scientific developments, which is true. Sony has its fundamental roots in the depth of its electronics technology. This capability has vested Sony with a leadership position in consumer as well as industrial electronics, despite the severe competition that came in from the Korean companies. This is also evidenced by continuing innovations in PlayStation, camera sensors, robotics and in special design elements of its products and robotics. In fact, Sony's camera sensors are a standard feature and probably the first choice in a whole range of smartphones of different manufacturers. Bose is another example. Bose is a company that specializes in audio purity. How the fundamental foundations of acoustic purity can be leveraged to ensure a niche and differentiation for the company got illustrated by Bosch. It is a technological behavior that lasted through its various products. What are the facets of technological behavior? We can develop that in terms of the hardware specifications, in terms of the operating system, experiential novelty, timeliness to market and user affordability. Together it forms a holistic paradigm. What is user affordability? It reflects the ultimate relevance of the product to generate value for the user in return to the price paid. Hardware specifications define the core performance of a product. Operating system defines the ultimate product performance. It is the brain of the device. Experimental novelty defines how a product delivers the experience in a fashion that is hitherto unexperienced by the consumers. Timeliness to market occurs when a product is introduced in such a way that it leads to a transformation in how the activities are performed. Together, affordability, hardware, software or the operating system, novelty and timeliness dictate or determine the technological behavior of a firm. This behavior also influences the returns that can be provided by the product to the firm. In return for all the costs and expenses incurred in the development, manufacturing and delivery of the product to the customer. Technological behavior therefore connects the investments that are made with the returns that are earned. However, neither product perfection nor its driver, the perfect technological behavior are rarely achieved in an optimal fashion in the first occurrence, even for a virtuous form. Apple had its design and OS elegance always with it, but it could not master the large screen approach of Samsung or the high pixel and image stabilization camera technologies of Nokia. It has decided to remain with its cut camera technology rather than the punch hole camera technology for a long time. Only Apple 14 is likely to have a punch hole uh, technology. Samsung did not go beyond the plastic body technology initially and chose to introduce a superior body only in the sixth iteration of its Galaxy series of cell phones. Call it obduracy or call it uh, technological behavior, but some irrationality is seen. 
and it also tells us that technological behavior of forms, however great they are, is not perfect always. LG has been a consistent follower. It has never been a pioneer. However, it scored its own victories with the thinnest bezel design ever, G3, and curved phones Flex. That did not stop the collapse of its business either. In this case, technological virtuosity was not taken to the fullest length of having commercial viability. Even the visible and successful accomplishments of competitors do not seem to alter the technological behavior of firms beyond a point. They do what they wish to do. And that is the mold technological behavior gives for firms. But there are positive molds as well. Apple, for example, continues to lead all other firms in terms of the build quality. So what are the twin features of technological development and how do we characterize this? Apple has certain benefits of this technological behavior. Even though Apple recognized the inevitability of larger screen phones and introduced iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus only with the large screens, the firm unfortunately did not find it necessary to develop and offer the superior bezel technology compared to LG's or higher camera technology comparable to Nokia's or unique dust and water resistance comparable to Sony's in the updated product offerings. Apple recognized only one facet of the evolving smart device technology, that is the larger phone structure. That's how iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus came. But at the same time, three other uh, developments were available and could be seen in the competitor products. LG gave thin bezel technology. Nokia gave higher Zeiss camera technology, going up to even 108MP. Sony gave for the first time dust and water resistance. However, Apple did not incorporate any of these three additional technological innovations in its product range. So, we can say that Apple's technological behavior partially virtuous to say it was not complete. Why does it happen? When it could happen to a great company such as Apple, known for its pioneering spirit and innovative spirit, it can happen more easily for other firms. Why does it happen? Two reasons. The firms find it difficult to acknowledge and appreciate the superior behavior of competitors and consequently delay a responsive behavior as long as possible. We may call it irrationality, we may call it obduracy, we may call it leadership ego, but this is what the plain fact is. The other aspect is that certain firms foundationally tend to be prone only to certain technological behaviors, wanting to be always ahead in certain core areas ahead in all areas or be just a follower. Even when perfect technological behavior could be well within the reach of a firm, purely from a technological point of view, certain behavior patterns of technology management relating to timeliness and affordability may influence a less than perfect approach. These are the two reasons why companies do not become virtuous on all aspects of technology. So we have a situation where things are near perfect, not completely perfect. We may wonder that if perfection is impossible even for a Sony or Apple, what would be the chance for smaller firms? However, perfection is not a function of scale, it is a behavioral mindset. What are the factors that are going to influence the technological behavior of a firm? One, a firm's own fundamental technological strengths and technological foundations. Two leadership's own cautious disposition or adventurous disposition towards innovations. Three, investments that are made by the firm on innovations. Four, risk-taking profile of the firm and its leadership. These are the four factors that determine the technological behavior of the firm. Determined firms, whether they are big or small, can certainly achieve at least a state of near perfection. Near perfection is achieved when a firm seeks superiority on each of the five dimensions which I listed earlier, hardware, software, novelty, timeliness and affordability. It would not be suffice to be a leader on just some dimensions and be laggards on others. If you are so, you won't be getting a holistic experience at one level and you will not be able to fully utilize the potential you hold at another level. Interestingly, near perfection in technological behavior turns out to be a conflict, if not clash, 
between the technology leadership that a firm needs to have and the management leadership that the firm happens to have. The firm technologically may be capable of achieving everything that is technologically possible, but leaders tend to hold back the reins and they say that we don't need to give everything to the market simultaneously and in a costly fashion. These factors tend to be on the low side when they are influenced by short-run economics, that is the technological foundations, the leadership's disposition, level of investments and risk-taking profile, they tend to be against technological innovation or technological virtuosity when the companies bother too much about the short-run economics. They cause the product attributes of their firms to be less than perfect. While technology leadership can drive the hardware, software and novelty components, management and leadership tends to drive the timeliness and affordability components. There is therefore a combination of technology, science, management and leadership that is required to achieve a perfect state or near perfect state in technological behavior. The balance would be unique to each firm. How much of science and technology, how much of management and leadership, what should drive what. Ideally, both should be integrated, intertwined and each aware of the strengths it brings to the table. Between hardware excellence, software perfection, novelty, timeliness to the market, affordability to the user, the go-to situation. What is that? In respect of technology component, for example, it would need to be between hardware excellence and software perfection or between both these together on one hand and novelty on the other. Similarly, a balance would need to be struck between the timeliness to the market and the affordability to the user. This brings us to the second principle of near perfection, which is that a fine balance within all the five components is essential and that fine balance gets done based on the product and the management. Integrating the discussion so far, it is clear that near perfection does not happen by accident. It is a behavioral process within each organization. It happens by achieving near perfection on each of the five dimensions on one hand and striking a fine balance among the technology and management components of the business. How do we ensure that technological behavior is progressive? Firms in the business of technology intensive products have a challenge because the developments that look good and progressive at this stage of planning may become less competitive by the time of execution. And if the execution happens to be a protracted long run affair, then the utility of the innovation will become even less. While planning technological innovation and product development, current plans would look appropriate and look modern futuristic. But once the competitive landscape takes place in a complete manner, the deficiencies become patent. What we thought was futuristic would probably be contemporary or even lag in respect of some features. So what we need to do is to view in retrospect from the date of launch of a new product, technological behavior of forms that shape product evolution so that it is perfect. So launch date is the date from which you have to assess the technological competence of the firm, not certainly from the date of planning. This inherent feature of technological behavior of firms is contrarian to the need to develop technologically and commercially competitive products of perfection for a point of future. This deficiency seems to hurt even firms which are giants on technological and commercial dimensions. Ability to forecast how the current product that is being developed would be looking like in terms of its competition, in terms of the changing customer requirements at that time will be the one that will determine the positive technological behavior of a firm. The prescription to address the deficiency of not being futuristically competitive is rather simple. It requires the firms to modify their technical behavior in an insightful and futuristic manner, almost like a back to the future manner. Firms should be able to review future products in retrospect as though the firm is already at the point of launch, even while staying at the current point of time in real time. 
so that the final product development is future perfect that is even if you are in 2022 develop a product which is going to be launched in 2026 you should visualize a situation where 2026 is within us and we are able to evaluate our newly developed product with reference to the customer requirements at that point of time and the competitor requirements as well as competitor place at that point of time that's how we will make the product development really future perfect firms must prior to launching the development of any product imagine and conceptualize the competitive landscape that could present itself to the firm at the time of actual product launch in future we will eschew all perceptions within ourselves that we are the best and whatever we are doing cannot be matched by the other competition we should be alive to the possibility that whatever we are doing could be probably bettered by the competition by the time we are ready for the launch therefore we have to assess the capabilities of the firm as well as our competitors to incorporate the perfect or near perfect dimensions in product development but that would still not be the end of the exercise the real test for the firm is to take a leap into the prospective future and assess the planned product profile in retrospect and evaluate its status on the perfection scale. The more a technology and a product is planned in a prospective future, but viewed in a virtual retrospect from the intended date of launch and further improvements affected, the more effective would be the journey of perfection. What you get after five years in most cases is the product that has been planned four years back or whatever it has been the lead time. What we need to do is to get four years hence the product that has been planned or that would be planned four years later only that we need to have that much of additional competitive capability in the design so that it is future proof that is the challenge which we have and that's where technological behavior has to be on a standout basis and this happens when you look at great developments that are happening we are aware of the 3D revolution that's happening. 3D is a name that is given for additive manufacturing. The beginnings of the 3D printing revolution showed up in a 2014 PWC survey of more than 100 manufacturing companies. At that time of survey, 11% had switched to volume production of 3D printed parts or products. In 3D printing, you straight away take a design which is there in the computer into the production floor through the 3D machines using materials that can be used to compose the product through molds and dyes. It doesn't require any material joining, any material forming, any machining. It actually doesn't involve loss of material as it happens in today's metal cutting, metal forming, metal joining activities. These are the companies which have already led the industry in terms of 3D printing, GE, Aurora Flight Solutions, Lockheed Martin. What is common amongst these three companies? They are all aerospace companies. Aerospace has been one of the frontier areas for application of 3D printing. Among the numerous companies using 3D printing to wrap up production are GE, Jet Engines, Medical Devices and Home Appliance Parts. Lockheed Martin and Boeing, Aerospace and Defense, Aurora Flight Sciences, Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, Invisalign, Dental Devices, Google, Consumer Electronics and the Dutch company Luxexcel, Lenses for Light Emitting Diodes or LEDs. Watching these developments, McKinsey, the global consulting firm, recently reported that 3D printing is ready to emerge from its niche status and become a viable alternative to conventional manufacturing processes in an increasing number of applications. Some projections have that the figure is going to rise to 42% by 2021. That figure hasn't yet been achieved, but probably by 2024, 40% of all products manufactured could be through additive manufacturing. Why does it happen that way? Because we can make very complicated parts through the 3D methodology. The areas which cannot be machined can be filled in through the 3D printing and it doesn't also have the disadvantages of conventional 
sand molding or die cast molding. Porosity will not be there in this process. Pieces can be used to be molded separately and also assembled further to be produced as one piece in a single run. A simple example is sunglass. The 3D process allows the porosity and mixture of plastics to vary in different areas of the frame. The ear pieces come out soft and flexible, while the rims holding the lenses are hard. No assembly is required. Additive manufacturing is particularly useful in short-run prototype developments and it has proved itself in that area. Many industries such as aerospace and automobiles pioneered the use of additive manufacturing. It is actually called rapid prototyping because prototypes for uh, new vehicles, new devices can be done in quick time using the 3D printing methodology. But today's situation is more than just prototyping. As I said, one of the oldest uses for 3D printers has been the quick and efficient creation of prototypes. The printers for 3D printing were invented in 1983. From then, companies have been using 3D in different areas to get the desired end product, partly to test the concept and partly to present it to the investor to get additional investments to develop this technology further. Technology has become more accessible and adaptable, leading to several new mainstream applications besides rapid prototyping. If a startup is ready to launch a new product and isn't certain of the demand, the firm can print a small amount of product to test the waters through the 3D printing methodology. Low volume production is common when it comes to medical devices. For example, manufacturers can create, test and redesign their products for optimization. The main development through this 3D printing is that from a primarily prototyping solution, we should exploit the full potential for mainstream manufacturing. That is to end part as the stage one and finally to the end product. We have seen experiments of 3D houses that are getting printed. We have seen experiments bringing out certain human organs through 3D printing. These are experiments, but we need to make this mainstream. The industrial applications of 3D are going great guns. In aerospace and defense, which has been the earliest adopter of 3D printing, the first use goes back to 1989. As of now, we have 16.8% share of the 10.4 billion additive manufacturing market going to aerospace and defense. Second, industrial goods. It includes the production of machinery components, tooling and equipment for manufacturing various other goods. And here again, 3D printing is coming among trumps. Consumer goods is another industry where additive manufacturing provides the need for quick changeover of the products from consumer electronics to toys and sportwear. Key players within the consumer goods industry are increasingly recognizing 3D printing as a valuable addition to the existing manufacturing solutions. Automotive industry which is the cousin brother on the ground of aerospace industry, is going to be a great user of additive manufacturing. In 2019 alone, the additive manufacturing revenues reached $1.4 billion. This figure will only increase. In certain areas like sports cars and performance racing, design tools like generative design and topology optimization are slowly changing traditional approaches to designing parts. Medical and dental industry is going to be one area where there would be significant use of 3D printing. 97% of the medical additive manufacturing experts are confident that the 3D printing in medical devices and dental devices is going to increase. For example, braces which need to be fitted onto the teeth have to have very complex shapes and that can be customized through 3D printing. Prosthetics bioprinting of organs is going to be versatile and wide ranging in future. In business strategy, there is a big role for 3D printing. 3D printing can eliminate costs like nothing else so far has done. If we use 30% as the waste that happens in a machining operation, by having additive manufacturing across the full component range, 
we can save 30% of the material cost right away at the minimum. And in terms of the development, instead of depending upon the normal supply chain, additive manufacturing can help a company for quick R&D, quick tooling, prototyping and production. And that would reduce the time to market and increase the revenue earning capability of the apart from the components being perfect. It is also going to help many companies develop and improve their process. It is going to set the benchmark of tolerance and finish and that will help the general manufacturing process that are employed in the company. Speed and innovation are essential in a business strategy and these will help the company to be more competitive. 3D printing will help in the speed of innovation overall. So the role of 3D printing is manifold. Material saving, therefore cost saving, time saving because of the rapid prototyping and the ability to create products which cannot be created otherwise provides unique competitive advantage. There are several industrial applications of 3D printing, some we have already seen and some we will discuss now. The injector head for Ariane 6 launcher has been developed by the Ariane group which is a joint venture of Airbrush group and Saffron. The team took a design that originally required 248 components and reduced it to one 3D printed part. Imagine this change. 248 components to be assembled into one end product. But now through 3D printing we have that product just as one 3D printed part. The material used for the part was a nickel based alloy. While casting and machining used to take longer than 3 months, the production time with additive manufacturing was reduced to 35 hours that is just one and a half days compare it with 3 months which it used to take earlier and that has been accomplished with EOSM 404 3D printer with 4 parallel lasers. An additional advantage obviously was 50% cost reduction was achieved. Porsche has recently introduced a new concept for sport car seating that leverages the 3D printing and lattice design. The new seats feature polyurethane 3D printed central seat and backrest cushion sections which can be customized by three formless levels, hard, medium and soft. The company plans to 3D print 40 prototype seats for use on European racetracks as early as May 2020 which it has done with customer feedback being used to develop the final street legal models for mid 2021 for which the company is well on its course. Franco Bicycles has launched a new line of e-bikes featuring a 3D printed composite frame manufactured by California based startup Arevo. Part of the Emery bike range, the frame is featured in the Emery 1 e-bike. It makes the world's first bike with a 3D printed frame. One of the unique aspects behind the production of this 3D printed carbon fiber frame is that it was manufactured as a single part as opposed to a multi-piece assembly that is typical for traditional bike frames. Some more uh, examples. Clear aligners or dental devices used to adjust and straighten teeth. You can see the complexity of the braces, the kind of shapes they need to have and if those shapes are not maintained in alignment with the teeth of an individual, it will be very painful and the people don't use braces because of the discomfort due to the misalignment. If these are produced with 3D printing, near perfect shapes will be achieved. The key technologies enabling are st stereolithography and material jetting. These provide high material speed and high accuracy. In addition to these resin based process, we have HP's powder based technology multi-jet fusion. It is also gaining traction. The key reason for using 3D printing in a manufacturing of clear aligners is the ability to customize them cost effectively since clear aligners are inherently individualized products. This is an example of mass customization being achieved through technology that is state of the art. Adidas for example. 3D prints midsoles for the future craft 4D sneakers using carbon's proprietary digital light synthesis technology. One of the key benefits of using 3D printing in this way 
is to improve show performance for various sports thanks to the various properties of the midsole. This is a one of the kind design of a midsole and generally it features 20,000 struts for better cushioning and that would be impossible to create with traditional techniques. With injection or compression molding, it would be impossible to create midsoles with the variable properties needed. Therefore, it requires assembly. Whereas with 3D printing, the whole thing can be created as one integrated part. 3D printing is helping to transform the production of bearings at Bowman Additive Production, a leading UK bearings manufacturer. Using HP's multi-jet fusion technology and PA11 nylon material, Bowman has been able to manufacture its bespoke roller train cage. This part indicates the complexity of the manufacturing process. It contains an interlocking structure that uses the rolling elements to pin together each section of the cage. The result of the additive manufacturing has been that the bearings possess a 70% increased load bearing capacity and an increased working life of up to 5% while reducing the time to manufacture and the cost of manufacture. Airbus, Ford, BMW are major companies in their respective fields, aerospace, automobile respectively. On 20th June 2014, the first 3D printed metal part, a humble titanium bracket was manufactured by Airbus and it took to the skies on board a commercial jetliner. From then, 3D technology has been powering growth of components for new airline designs as well as for existing aircraft designs. In respect of Ford, the automobile company, in 2018, the company got its award for use of 3D printing for tools. It was an assembly lift assist produced using FDM. This 3D printed part cost 50% less than a conventional counterpart and also reduced the lead times. Weight reduction also happened as a corollary. Engineers were able to produce a significantly lighter fixture. BMW is one of the front runners in the use of additive manufacturing. It has printed over the last decade 1 million parts. And in the case of end parts too, BMW has successfully used 3D printing. As an example, a metal fixture for its ID roster model was developed by BMW. An optimized roof bracket was developed and it weighed 45% less than the previous versions. Today, the company can 3D print up to 238 of these parts per platform, making the roof bracket the first mass-produced additively manufactured automotive component. Compared to the millions of components that are machined, punched, shaped or joined year after year, the numbers are still small. But the potential is there to get into mainstream because the advantages of material saving, cost saving, weight saving and time saving are too good to be ignored. Technology will continue to be better in 3D printing to make it the mainstream activity. Lime Corporate again has been one of the pioneers of using 3D printing, but this time for orthopedic products. As I said, the prosthetics that go into your body, the biomedical implants require complex shapes and they also require complex materials. The hip joint cup or the knee joint cups or the bones, they all are to be customized they also need to have very special properties including high finishes. 3D printing fits the bill exactly in that area. Channel is uh, demonstrating the potential of 3D printing by having a mascara brush developed as per uh, 3D printing. It uses a technology that uses a laser beam to fuse layers of polyamide powder. And with this you get a rough granular texture which helps the adhesion of the mascara to the lashes. Siemens Mobility is another example of using 3D printing. It manufactures spare parts and tooling on demand at the Siemens Mobility RRX Rail Service Center. 100 trains are expected to enter the depot each month and 3D printing will play an important role in optimizing spare part production. They reduce cost and lead times while getting 
operational agility. 3D printing is not going to be the end of this story. Even as 3D printing aspects to become mainstream, we have 4D printing that is coming up pretty fast in the early innovation phase. It also has the potential to transform organizations with customized and adaptive solutions for supply chain changes. We can link product design directly to manufacturing. We can use pneumatic flaps on airplane engines that open and close automatically and 4D printing is extremely useful for that kind of special parts and drag reduction and improved fuel efficiency and functionality would be exempt. So there are certain parts which are going to be 4D printed directly from the computer through the manufacturing process and it could lead to other design innovations as well. Supply chain will benefit because of self-assembly of items and components. Valves which are used using hydrogen material will close automatically through sensor assisted mechanisms for control of water flow. 4D printed pipes could theoretically change their diameter according to flow volume or make other physical adaptations based on the environmental criteria. The ability to link part not only to the design conditions but also to the environmental conditions embedding design flexibility and actual operational adaptability in, in the component is something very futuristic that is going to be the direction 4D printing would take. As I said right now the promise of existing additive manufacturing is going to be very huge. We have aerospace, defense, automotive, construction, energy, medical and consumer goods as the prime industries for additive manufacturing and the parts that can be made out of additive manufacturing are spare parts, lighter parts, complex parts, multi-material parts, rotors, stators, etc., rapid prototypes, models, molds, dyes, sets, implants, prosthetics, human organic substitutes, stem cells, micro parts. The list it looks is endless. But let us look at what additive manufacturing can do in one specific industry, that is the Indian automobile industry. Indian automobile industry in its recent peak year of 2017-18 produced 3 million cars, 1 million utility vehicles, nearly 1 million commercial vehicles, 1 million three-wheelers and 23 million two-wheelers. It totals 29 million automobiles of all kinds. Based on certain assumptions on the unladen weights or curb weights of the major types of vehicles, the total iron and steel consumption by the Indian automobile industry is over 11 million tons annually. This represents the weight of machine parts in the aggregate. If 11 million tons is the curb weight of the machine parts, the gross weight before machining would be as high as 14 million tons. It is actually an understatement. The loss in metal removal to the order of 3 million tons which is happening is a waste. It accounts for Rs 135 billion annually and this is also accompanied by enormous operational costs in running machining centers, scrap removal, coolants, recycling, cutting and forming tools, transport of materials, transport of waste and so on. So if you are able to manufacture through additive manufacture straight away components that meet 11 million tons of weight, you save that 3 million tons which is now currently being incurred. Actually, if you look at philosophically, we call uh, conversion of a part into a product or conversion of a set of parts into a product value addition. We say that value is getting added when material becomes a component and a component becomes a product. However, if you really look at my example, it is actually value destruction that has been happening. We are taking a bar of 100 kilos and making it 70 kilos by the time it comes to the component stage and in this process, we are also losing maybe 5% in wastage, 5% in wrong uh, machining and so on. The waste is enormous. This value erosion can be negated. That is value erosion can be removed and value accretion in the truest sense of the term obtained when you adopt additive manufacturing without loss of any material. The savings would be immense. That is where additive manufacturing comes up as an exciting new frontier of automobile manufacturing in the digital age. 
what has been projected for automobile industry can be projected for any other industry which uses components those components can be metal based or those components can be non metal based there is no limit for the application of additive manufacturing but what we require is a sound and solid base of materials technologies and computer integrated machine tool capabilities to make additive manufacturing parts these are the notes related to additive manufacturing please go through them at your convenience thank you for your attention we'll meet in the next lecture